Hello again, and welcome back to our discussion on the book by Pastor Frederick Fichtner, Wishful Thinking. And if you've been with me before, you know that it's just Pastor Beekner's dictionary of words from A to Z. We're moving right along. We've gotten through all the E's and now we're going to the F's. Feet. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, says Isaiah 52 verse 7. Not how beautiful are the herald's lips which proclaim the good tidings, or his eyes as he proclaims them, or even the good tidings themselves, but how beautiful are the feet, the feet without which he could never have made it up into the mountains, without which the good tidings would never have been proclaimed at all. Who knows in what inspired way his heart, his mind, his spirit of the herald came to receive the good tidings of peace and salvation in the first place. But as to the question whether he would actually do something about them, put his money where his mouth was, his shoe leather where his inspiration was, his feet were the ones that finally had to decide. Maybe it is always so with us. For generally speaking, if you want to know who you really are, as distinct from who you like to think you are, keep an eye on where your feet take you. The next word is fool. Worldly wisdom is what more or less all of us have been living by since the Stone Age. It is best exemplified by such utterances as, you've got your own life to live. Business is business. Charity begins at home. Don't get involved. God helps those who help themselves. Safety first. Drive carefully. The life you save may be your own. All of this is worldly wisdom in a nutshell. But what God says on the other hand is, the life you save is the life you lose. In other words, the life you clutch, hoard, guard, and play safe with is in the end a life worth little to anybody, including yourself, and only a life given away for love's sake is a life worth living. To bring his point home, God gave us Jesus who in turn gave his life away to the extent of dying a national disgrace without a penny in the bank or a friend to his name. In terms of human wisdom, Jesus was a perfect fool. And if you think you can follow him without making something like the same kind of fool of yourself, you are laboring under not a cross, but a delusion. For St. Paul says, unless we become fools for Christ, we are still clinging, hoarding, and playing it safe. Forgiveness. To accept forgiveness means to admit that you've done something that needs to be forgiven. And thus, both parties must swallow the same thing, their pride. 
This seems to explain what Jesus means when he says to God, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, Jesus is not saying that God's forgiveness is conditional upon our forgiving others. For in the first place, forgiveness that's conditional isn't really forgiveness at all. And in the second place, our unforgivingness is among those things about us which we need to have God forgive us most. What Jesus apparently is saying is that the pride which keeps us from forgiving is the same pride which keeps us from accepting forgiveness. And will God please help us do something about it? When somebody you've wronged forgives you, you're spared the dull and self-diminishing throb of a guilty conscience. When you forgive somebody who has wronged you, you're spared the dismal corrosion of bitterness and wounded pride. So for both parties, forgiveness means the freedom again to, at pe to be at peace inside their own skins and to be glad in each other's presence once again. Freedom. To obey the law of the land leaves us our constitutional freedom, but not the freedom to follow our own consciences wherever they lead. To obey the dictates of our own consciences, consciences leaves us freedom from the sense of moral guilt but not the freedom to gratify our own strongest appetites. To obey our strongest appetites for drink, sex, power, revenge, or whatever leaves us the freedom of, a, of an animal to take what we want when we want it, but not the freedom of a human being to be human. The old prayer speaks of God in whose service is perfect freedom. The paradox is not as opaque as it sounds. It means that to obey God himself, who above all else wishes us well, leaves us the freedom to be the best and gladdest that we have it in us to become. We're on the G's. Gluttony. If you've been with me since the beginning, remember after we talked about the definition of bread, he referred us to gluttony. A glutton is one who raids the icebox for a cure for spiritual malnutrition. God. Now, just an aside here, you know, one thing that I learned in seminary the first time, the first year I ever went there was when one of the professors says, you know, you're not here to study God because God cannot be put under a microscope. We're here to study about God. And this is Pastor Beekner's definition of God. There must be a God because A, since the beginning of history, the most multicultural majority of people have intermittent, intermittently believed there was B, it is hard to consider the vast and complex structure of the universe in general and of the human mind in particular 
without considering the possibility that they issued from some ultimate source, itself vast, complex, and somewhat mindful. C. Built into the very being of even the most primitive man, there seems to be a profound psychophysical need of or hunger for something like truth, goodness, love, and under one alias or another, for God. And D, every age and culture has produced mystics who have experienced a reality beyond reality and have come back using different words and images, but obviously and without collusion, describing with awed adoration the same indescribability. Now, statements of this sort and others like them have been advanced for several thousand years as proofs of the existence of God. But a 12-year-old child can see that not that not that no one of them is watertight. And even all of them taken together won't convince any of us unless our predis predisposition to be convinced outweighs our predisposition not to be. It is as impossible to prove or disprove that God exists beyond the various and conflicting ideas people have dreamed up as it is to prove or disapprove that goodness exists beyond the various and conflicting ideas people have dreamed about what is good. All wise, all powerful, all loving, all knowing. We bore to death both God and ourselves with our chatter. God cannot be expressed, but only experienced. In the last analysis, you cannot pontificate, but can only point. A Christian is one who points at Christ and says, I can't prove a thing, but there's something about his eyes and his voice. There's something about the way he carries his head, his hands, the way he carries his cross, the way he carries me. Well, I think I've given you enough to ponder in this session. So I'll say goodbye for now. And I'm looking forward already to the next time we'll be discussing more definitions from Pastor Beekner from his book, Wishful Thinking. Goodbye. See you next time.